second, let's see the speaker. <laughs> um, let's see if he's around. He's here. He's here. Um, so, Shai Kramunda Adam, can you please share your screen, unmute yourself? Here you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Fine. Go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, should I start the talk? Yes, yes. Go. Please. Go. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shaikram Alam. I'm going to give a talk on the title named Tracking the Early Events of Aggregation in A beta switch peptides employing protein charge transfer spectra. So, here, uh, here the protein of our interest is the A beta peptide. So, this peptide is responsible for the Alzheimer's disease, and which happens by forming insoluble amyloid fibrils, which, deposit, which deposit in the neurofil. So this is the schematic of the aggregation pathway. So this is the a major monomer, which has a fast kinetics initially, which transforms into the partially folded beta sheet structure. And after that, there is a slow transitions, which forms the fibrils or the protofibrils proto and then the fibrils. So various, there are various methods to characterize this aggregation pathway. Some of them are using extrinsic fluorophores like thiophilin T, which binds to the fibrils and give fluorescence or some other are the congruent assay or the ANS assay. And some other are the DLS time, dynamic light scattering and all. But here we are mainly focused in the early stages of aggregation. So this is a very fast rapid uh, process and to characterize this thing is a bit difficult and a bit uh, tricky. So this is the monoman, this is the beta sheet structure which is formed. So generally CD can be useful. Uh, circular dichroism because there is a transition in the conformational of the in the beta sheet structure. But the problem is that since it is fast, it is a bit problematic. So for that, we used uh, some switch peptides. This is the schematic of the switch peptide. I'm going into details. So this is the peptide. This is the peptide, the A beta 140. This is a sequence of the peptide. And this is the amyloid core, this part, this amyloid core. So I'm using this A beta 16 to 22 of this A beta peptide and doing all the experiments. So what does the switch does is that when it is in the switch off mode, so this isn't actually a peptide one. So when, so it isn't actually a peptide one, this switch F off is in the pH, acidic pH, like pH two. So when it's in the pH two, there isn't any uh, peptide backbone, but when it is transferred to pH seven or say in some basic pH like pH seven, then there is some O2 and SL transfer that takes place and then only it becomes the peptide backbone and then only it, the aggregation happens. So this, this part, this, part, this uh, switch peptide thing, thing gives us enough time to, uh, to systematically analyze this um, kinetics of the early stages of aggregation. So uh, the switch peptides help us to uh, monitor the aggregation in the early stages, in its early stages. And here we use our novel technical approaches to monitor them, which I'm going to discuss in the uh, future slides. Before that, the composition that I'm going to use, this is the peptide, this is the peptide uh, sequence. Uh, this is the switch over here. And there are various, we did various mutations. We did various mutations like lysine and glutamate in that fragment, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, some of them got precipitated and some other didn't show any aggregation because of the charges of the residues which inserted and created some which forbidden the aggregation assembly. So finally, we ended up with this, uh, this five peptides. Some of them were acetylated, some were not, and some we used for lower concentration as low as 50 micromolar and some were at 200 micromolar. So these are the five peptides which we used for our aggregation assembly. So before doing the procharts, we first um, did the conventional techniques like the CD, the circular dichroism, along with some other dyes. So here I'm highlighting the CD, the circular dichroism spectra. So uh, to know more, I am just highlighting this is a sample, it's a random, not my data, just a sample 
to make you understand better. So generally what happens initially in the random coil state of the a beta peptides, it is in the random coil state. So it gives a peak at around this one, this green line. But when it forms beta sheets, then it becomes the red one. This is for the alpha helix, but it doesn't show like that in the real scenario. It just changes from the random coil to the beta sheet. So from green to to red, this transition takes place. So in our case, we did for all the five peptides, and what we found is that as the time progressed, the increase in the 220, which is a characteristic of the beta sheet, increased for all the cases, for all the peptides, whether it is acetylated or non-acetylated, as well as for lower, as well as higher. So lower concentrations took a bit longer time, whereas the higher concentrations, it was quite rapid. Instead, although there were some switches available, but still some of the irrigation was low, uh, was so fast as around 60 minutes only. Which suggests that the, yes, the, the, the conformational changes are happening in that irrigation. Then we did NSSA. In that NSSA, what happens is when NSSA is a fluorescent probe, which when being in the free state, it doesn't give any fluorescence and it's maximized around 520. But when bound to hydrophobic surfaces, when the when the caps, when the uh, monomers are coming closer, it gives higher fluorescence and emisha also gets bit blue shifted. So in this case also, what I found is that as the aggregation proce uh, pro uh, proceeded, uh, we see a blue shifted with the increase in fluorescence in the ANSSA, and this is consistent for all the peptides, which suggests that the aggregation is happening and they are coming closer. Again, we did THTSA also, hyoglobin TSA, which is a character for the fibril formation of the peptides and its fluorescence is around 490 nanometer when excited at 4, 450. In free state, it's give very low fluorescence because there are no fibrils, but when bound to fibrils, it gives high fluorescence. So in this case, there are the, all these five peptides. We found that yes, with the aggregate with as the kinetic proce uh, aggregation proceeded, the in, there is increase in the THT absorbance, suggesting there are some fibril formation, while in some of the peptides. Basically, in the uh, some of the non acetylated peptides only, uh, there there wasn't that much uh, THT increase. As you can see from the graph, this is the kinetics which you plot. We integrated the area over time, so we integrated the area and then plotted versus time, and we found out this is the kinetics for all the cases. But in, in this case, there wasn't much change, but in these cases, there are some changes. So just think THT was able to detect the changes, but in only cases of that fibril formation. So uh, till now, we have discussed only the conventional part. So my topic mainly starts from here only, so which is the unconventional intrinsic chrome force. Basically, whatever uh, till now I have discussed, in all the cases, there was an extrinsic chrome force which we are adding, which may alter the kinetics. But so we need to have some uh, intrinsic chrome force that is already present in the peptides. So generally, the intrinsic chrome force that are present in a protein or peptide system are the peptide backbone or the aromatic amino acids. The, but the absorbance of the aromatic amino acids and the peptide, uh, peptide backbone, they absorb only till 320. After that, there isn't, they should not uh, absorb. But uh, what we found from our uh, previous reports, it, it was reported that uh, some of the proteins, which are very ch uh, highly charged, they show absorbance way, below, way beyond 320 nanometer. Some of the like highly charged, like lysosome, HSA and all, uh, so they showed much higher absorbance even in the uh, what's called the higher wavelength region. So this may be because of some uh, because of the some of the reasons that was not known till then. But in 2017, from our lab, we proposed that this uh, we took alpha 3C monomeric protein, and in this case, we saw that the absorbance in this tail was quite, in the absorbance in this region was quite high. Although this protein doesn't have any aromatic amino acid, it was free of uh, um, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan, although it was showing absorbance in this region. What was it was postulated was that there is some electronic charge transfer that has been happening from the cation or from the cation to the anion, like uh, there are multiple kind modes of charge transfer that may be happening. And uh, some of the charges are from the backbone, the electron rich backbone to the electron deficient site terminal of the lysine. And in some case, the electron rich glutamate to the backbone of the relatively electropositive uh, backbone. And these uh, transitions are happening from the HOMO to the HOMO of the more cationic uh, entity to the LUMO of the uh, relatively uh, electronegative species. 
species. So in our case, what uh, this is for the monomeric protein, but the basis was that this uh, this absorbance was mainly dependent on the 3D proximity of this charged materials. So what we assume was that during aggregation, when the monomers were expected to come closer, they should interact, and this kind of transitions should happen, and we should in, we should get increased absorbance in this tail region. So what we found is that for all the uh, peptides that we used in this study, we found that with time, it, it, it increased with time for all the peptides. So this suggests that this approach starts absorbance is increasing with time as, as, as compared to the circular decoration data. This is the kinetics, that, we, then that is the kinetics. We, uh, we calculated all the what is called, uh, we uh, took the absorbance data for all the wavelengths and plotted versus time, and we found out that we are getting an increase for all the peptides. So, uh, some of the increase were very steep, whereas some were very flat, kind of. But uh, anyway, we are getting some, we are getting appreciable changes over here. So, that was the Procher's absorbance that I've discussed. So, in, in 2020, 20, it was also reported that in, in contrast to the Procher's absorbance, there is Procher's luminescence also, where when the excited electron going to the LUMO from the HOMO, it may then come again back to the HOMO and recombine, and then it gives appreciable luminescence. So this, th this is the schematic of this uh, luminescence, this red one, uh, this, uh, this one, what is called this red one. It is again, uh, when the electrons, uh, it, uh, the, um, it is exciting, uh, when it is being excited, the charges are going is the electrons going up and then it is coming back down to the peptide backbone or some other highly electropositive from the origin from where it was generated. So we get appreciable luminescence in all in this. In this study was based on a monomeric protein only. So similar pattern we expect in this case also. So we did the process luminescence to monitor the switch shifted assembly and we found out that with with the, as the time increased we got what increased uh, signal of luminescence and it was consistent for all although in one case it wasn't uh, we didn't show much of the changes uh, we did the excitation of various wavelengths at 295 and took the reading from beyond and there are, uh, and it was consistent for multiple wavelengths possible and we then uh, plotted it versus time and we found out that yes it also shows similar kind of trajectory as that of the procharge absorbance, suggesting both of them are, both of the phenomena are quite related with each other. Then we tried to uh, 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 see some kinetics. We modeled the, uh, 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 whatever I have shown here, we tried to model the kinetics and we found at one, uh, what is called one time at which half of the aggregation was complete. We named it T half. And then we plotted this T half for all the various like CD absorbance as well as the luminescence data. And we tried, to show it in one slide, like uh, for various peptides, and we found out that more or less they were like quite correlating with each other. The, this one was less, it was less, and then, but in some cases it was not that exact, suggesting that the phenomena behind all these methods, although they were um, able to see the changes, but the phenomena behind everything, every other techniques was a bit different. So that may be the reason behind this. Uh, some of the changes observed in some of the cases, whereas in most of the cases, it was quite consistent. Then the earlier, whatever I have discussed in the luminescence, uh, steady, that was a lumin steady state luminescence, but here we use time resolved luminescence decay to monitor the switch peptide assembly. In this case, it was, uh, this is the decay plot. We excited the samples and then we collected the fluorescence in various channels and then we get the, the decay. And then we fitted this decay in this expression. That is the, uh, this is uh, the tau one and then alpha, uh, tau i and then alpha i. The alpha is the cont uh, respective contribution from the tau i. And when fitted in a discrete model, we found that the three exponential model fitted better. And we got uh, alpha one, tau one, alpha two, tau two, and alpha three, tau three, which has been shown here. Um, so here we can see that uh, these are the alpha, this gray one of the alpha values of the tau uh, alpha one, and then it's alpha two, and then alpha three, and the dashed one of the for aggregates. So we found out that the contribution from the lower, the contribution from the lower lifetime were higher for all the peptides, this gray bars. But as the, uh, but with aggregation, that even intensified more, that amplitude, it increased even more in most of the cases. 
suggesting that with aggregation, the mean lifetime that we calculated decreased. And this can also be a parameter to identify the changes in the switch peptide assembly. Uh, the reason of this being as the aggregation process, there were some chemical, there are some entities that may be forming, which come down from the LUMO quite quite quickly as compared to the monomers, which is giving to the more population of uh, the lower comp lifetime components as observed in this data. So this Prochar's luminescence lifetime, uh, time resolved luminescence in intensity can also give us information about uh, this uh, aggregation. And all these methods are based on intrinsic chromophores. We are not labeling or in, uh, doing anything like of that sort. Then uh, we also did the MEM analysis of the same lifetime uh, luminescence intensity. This is a model-free approach, this MEM analysis maximum entropy method. This is a model-free approach. The earlier uh, fit was we did for one order, two order, three order. But in this case, we just did for 100 orders. And then this is the model-free approach. And we found out that, yes, it complements the data of the discrete analysis. And we are getting three, kind, uh, three exponentials, three distributions, which is justifying, which is justifying the same data of the discrete model as well. Finally, we tried to compare all the techniques. This is the CD at 220. This is the absorbance at 340. This is the CD at 220. And we tried to change the percentage change of all the techniques. And we found out that the, uh, the NSTST, although they were good, they were as compared to 200% kind of change, but this absorbance and uh, the CD were much more efficient in uh, it much more, uh, much more uh, uh, sensitive and much more sensitive than the other data. So in conclusion, we can say that the Prochar's absorbance as well as luminescence were able to detect the changes in the aggregation in the early stages of aggregation. And the Prochar's absorbance highly correlated with the CD data, which gives a, which is a characteristic of the conformational changes in the secondary structure as compared with the T, uh, THT and ANS. And also this, Prochar's absorbance, if not, the, it is better than the CD, it is as good kind of with the CD. And our switch peptide model can become a template or can become a, a, a standard model to study the early stages of aggregation in the switch peptide uh, and can enable us to screen drugs for a bit of yeah, aggregation. Uh, these are the references. That I had, and I want to acknowledge uh, IIT Guwahati, India, for uh, providing me with all the necessary equipment for my uh, work. Thank you. Thank you, Shah. Uh, there is a little time for a few questions, and if any, please uh, use the chat or raise your hand. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, so it, how, so the, the luminescence spectrum, how the spectra, how uh, efficient is that signal? I mean, do you need to do a special background cleaning or, or, uh, or, or is uh, the, the, the efficiency, the yield of that process is, is, is high enough? So what, what I mean is that if you want to use that as a, be a compatible uh, uh, probe, you know, for, for luminescent probe. Uh, uh, so is that uh, the yield is high? We need to do some back yeah, uh, cleaning I, or something like that. Uh, yeah, actually the yield was a bit lower because they are not uh, what is called the conventional chromophores. The extinction coefficient of this absorbance was low in this region as well as the quantum yield also. I haven't shown the quantum yield. Here, but the quantum is for very kind of low kind of thing in this case. But anyway, this gives us a different region apart from the conventional techniques. And further improvement needs to be done in this uh, in this wavelength region because in this uh, what is called this in the higher wavelength region, if, even if we can just increase the quantum yield also or like that, we can also use this thing directly for like imaging and also because it won't interfere with the cellular comp uh, components as well. Yeah, okay. It's really helpful if you can at least increase the that thing. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Can I ask a question? Please, yes, Umesh. Yeah. Uh, Shahad Ramul, uh, it was a very nice presentation and in, uh, interesting observations. I'm just wondering whether you know you have tried 
ionic strength dependence on the aggregation of your right. protein. And if at all you do that, any change in fluorescence, would you attribute that to, um, you know, the structural changes okay. or uh, yes, sir. the effect of ionic strength on fluorescence? Okay, sir. Uh, we could have increased or like changed the ionic strength. But uh, the one problem that lies with it is that it may affect the aggregation assembly also. So if we just want to see the changes in the fluorescence, like the how the interactions are, uh, what is the uh, charge transfer, the degree of charge transfer that has been affected. But in other way, uh, the aggregation will also be hampered. So we can't directly say whether the it is because of the aggregation that has been happening or like because of the uh, screening of the charges that is taking place. Because initially when I uh, tried to incorporate some of the charges uh, while adding two lysines, we are not getting uh, seeing aggregation happening. So just a single mutation is like hampering the segregation formation. So increasing the salt or something like that, uh, increasing the ionic concentration may help us to get a better insight about the, what is called the better insight about the, the charge transfer phenomena, but it will in a way affect the aggregation and then we cannot have an conclusive result about it. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, I think it is time to switch uh, to the next talk. So thanks.